Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Lahari and uh, today's lecture is on radiographic interpretation of dental caries. The learning outcomes would be to interpret different types of caries and comprehend the outcome of caries process on tooth surfaces, categorize the radiologic detection of caries lesions and the difficulties encountered, recognize the limitations of imaging procedures in detecting carious lesions, interpretation of carious lesions on images and writing an appropriate report. Dental caries is a multifactorial disease uh, with the tooth, plaque, diet and saliva being the tetrad that is required for dental caries formation. Demineralization of tooth structure happens which results in a carious lesion. The clinical appearance of caries will vary with time. Early active lesions generally appear white chalky, uh, like chalky spots, and older arrested lesions can appear darker, brown, or black in color. The role of imaging in, in detection of carious lesions uh, is very important. Clinical examination is important for detection of caries on the occlusal and exposed smooth surfaces of the teeth. Whereas it is nearly impossible to clinically identify caries occurring in proximal surfaces, unless of course there is obvious cavitation. Caries causes demineralization of enamel and dentine, which leads to more X-ray photons that will penetrate a demineralized region of the tooth when exposed to radiation. Hence, it creates a radiolucent or a dark region on the image and gives impression of caries on the radiographic image. Let's look at different types of caries and how they appear on the radiograph. Let's start with interproximal caries, also called as proximal caries. One important thing that you must understand here is that the preferred image to detect interproximal caries in the posterior teeth especially is a bite wing image. We have molar bite wings and premolar bite wings depending on the area that is covered. Uh, generally films that are used uh, in adults and adolescents is a size 2 film which is placed horizontally and used. And in children size 1 or a zero film, zero sized film is used. The size 3 films which are ideally recommended for bite wing radiography are not being preferred anymore as they tend to bend in the mouth and distort the image. On the other hand, digital sensors, these solid state sensors may be too rigid and have a smaller active surface area for viewing. Hence, placing them for bite wing radiographs may sometimes uh, limit the area of, of, uh, uh, that is visible. Uh, a PSP which is more closer to a film is as easy as a film to position and a more preferred choice for viewing interproximal caries um, on a bite wing. So the images here are an adult bite wing showing the molar and part of a premolar region and there is a proximal lesion that you're able to see on the premolar here on the distal surface of the maxillary premolar. And this is the bite wing of um, a child showing you the right side involving the deciduous uh, molars. The importance of correct horizontal angulation. A couple of images over here and I want to make you understand that a bite wing when taken with the correct horizontal and vertical angulation, it demonstrates a carious lesion on the distal surface of the maxillary left first molar. You can see circled out in the image A. The same radiograph or the same area, the carry seems to be obscured in image B because of incorrect horizontal angulation and overlapping of the proximal surfaces. In image C, which is a vertical or, or an IOPA or, or a periopical view of the same area, also the um, proximal carry seems to be obscured because of incorrect vertical angulation. So this always happens and it's important that if a lesion is missed yet suspected clinically, perhaps another image should be taken to rule out the presence of caries. At this point in time, I would like you to understand the term cervical burner. 
It actually is an artifact that mimics a carious lesion near the CEJ um, of teeth. It often misinterpreted as caries and especially in patients who have periodontal bone loss. The image that you can see here, the patient has reasonable about 4 to 5 mm of bone loss generalized and then there is a radiolucent shadow at the neck of the teeth which mimics caries. But this actually is not caries. This is cervical burnout. The phenomenon that is involved here is as follows. As the x-ray beam meets the convex proximal surfaces of the tooth, those x-ray photons that pass almost tangentially through the root surface see less tooth structure than those photons that pass deeper through the tooth. This area of convexity is commonly located apical to the CEJ near the normal height of the alveolar crest. Hence, the thin, thinner tooth structure here absorbs fewer x-rays. Consequently, the area appears relatively more radiolucent on an image. So it's just an uh, illusion that appears because of lesser amount of radiation or x-ray photons being absorbed in this thin, relatively thinner area of the tooth, giving the false appearance of caries. Cervical burnout can also be seen in multi-rooted teeth when roots that are more buckly positioned do not overlap perfectly on the lingual or partial palatal root in a mesiodistal direction, often happening with the maxillary molars. When it comes to occlusal surface caries, these are um, again best examined clinically, but imaging actually helps to assess the depth of caries. But in case of small occlusal caries, uh, the clinical examination is more accurate than radiographs due to often a superimposition from surrounding sound enamel. That is evident in the image A here where you have a very tiny occlusal caries seen on the um, second molar, I'm sorry, the first molar and which is nearly obscured by the thicker uh, sound enamel. There is a larger uh, caries is very easy to detect uh, clinically as well as uh, very obvious on a radiograph because of larger amount of tooth destruction. Next we move on to MAC band effect. This is also an artifact and an illusion that can generally be uh, confused as caries. Uh, it is a radiolucent sign seen along line sorry seen along the DEJ. And it was first described by Ernst Mark. And this is a visual and perceptual artifact that happens because of differential stimulation and inhibition of neighboring receptors in the retina. Um, to overcome this effect, it's important to mask the more radio opaque enamel and then the MAC band effect should disappear if, if there is no real caries. However, if the MAC band effect does not disappear, then its presence indicates that there is definite caries involvement of the DEJ. For example, if you look at this image here, you do see a radiolucent line right under the um, thick, thicker radio opaque band of enamel and it gives you an illusion or an effect that there are, are appearance of a dark radiolucent line li right underneath the uh, thicker band of enamel. Uh, when compared to the lesser radiolucent or um, radio opaque dentine. Again, let me remind you, this is also an artifact. And uh, if you actually obscure the or mask the uh, more opaque enamel, you shouldn't be seeing it. Next, we move on to buccal and lingual surface caries. On a single image, it is impossible to localize caries as buccal or lingual surface simply because they superimpose over each other. So a second image with a different horizontal angulation may help to differentiate. Again, of course, clinical examination is a must to confirm diagnosis. When it comes to root caries, sometimes it may be difficult to differentiate it from cervical burnout. Again, clinical examination should come in handy. And when you actually put your probe in there and check, it should demonstrate irregularity or depression. If there is no bone loss around the tooth, then it's more likely to be cervical burnout. These are images of a bite wing showing um, 
secondary caries which is on the root surface which is also visible the same uh, area is also visible on a periapical view and you can view the same root caries in the second molar even on the periapical view as well as the premolar region. The term rampant caries is used for rapid progression caries with severe widespread involvement. Early childhood caries as well as radiation caries are types of rampant caries. This image here shows you uh, radiation caries uh, is an example of radiation caries in an adult. Generally, radiation caries are on the smooth surfaces near the cervical areas. Recurrent caries and residual caries. Uh, the term recurrent caries refers to secondary caries where you see radiolucent area at the junction between the restoration and the tooth uh, like the one here in the image C where you can see uh, secondary caries right under the restoration and even image D. Residual caries on the other hand uh, represents areas of demineralization that remain within the original lesion and when it is incompletely removed. Sometimes this is done purposefully, uh, especially during deep caries management, where they would want remineralization or tertiary dentine formation to take place. Certain radiolucent uh, dental materials could be confused for recurrent or residual caries. The shape of the radiolucency should help to differentiate whether it is caries or a restoration. Older composite materials um, can also mimic carious lesions. Generally, restorations that have been uh, um, prepared well or the cavity preparation done should have very well-defined borders like the one in the image A and B. And they may also have a radiopaque base or liner at the periphery indicating that they're actually restorations which have lesser filler material perhaps and that's why they are not casting a very distinct radio opaque shadow and they appear more radiolucent and hence should not be confused for secondary caries. So this brings me to the end of this topic more reading from uh, the textbook on uh, oral radiology from where I've taken most of my images and uh, written material. Thank you.